Starting here about uh, page 21 now today, we're looking at the section on uh, a topic two that deals with what is prayer, and we saw that it's praise, thanksgiving, it's confession, and then also it's point D, petition, as we think of that in regard to our own personal requests for ourselves. As I've mentioned, I think earlier, it is true that you can call intercessory prayers petition as well. But for the uh, sake of making a distinction between what we pray for ourselves and what we pray for others, we will call this petition and call the next point intercession. Now, as we look at this, and we've already gone over some of the points on it, I wanted to draw your attention to number six, which is on page 22, that God's answer to prayer may be yes, it may be no, it may be wait a while. Some question wait a while here, but I believe it's very biblical. For example, well, let's look at several examples. Abraham, the book of Genesis, after his Genesis chapter 15 request of God that he might have a child. And then, really, he has to wait many years through various trials in chapters 15 into 21 before that child, Isaac, finally comes. Or we could think of uh, Joseph. I'm quite sure, although the scripture doesn't tell us this, that after he was put on a camel by the Ishmaelites, sold, you remember, by his brothers to these people, and uh, after these traders were hauling him off away from his home, there would have been some very uh, great consternation in his heart, some deep suffering at the thought of uh, being pried away from his family, and then as he got into Egypt, as the weeks and as the months went by, the tremendous uh, prayer that he might be reunited with his family it would be a very natural uh, thing for a godly man like Joseph to do. And yet it was many years of delay before God would uh, work out his sovereign providential purposes in his life and uh, find a way to reunite him with his beloved father in chapter 46 of Genesis. Or Daniel. As we see in Daniel chapter 9, for example, particularly Daniel 9, 4 through 19, where he's engaged in one of the great prayers of the book of Daniel. And he's praying concerning his people, that having been uprooted from their own land and being in the Babylonian captivity, they might be brought back by God. And so he's, in essence, praying, bring, bring back the people, that is, restore them to their land, bring back the temple, bring back the city. And then right after that, the angel appears to him and gives him the famous prophecy of the 77s in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And in essence, is promising that the very three things he has earnestly prayed about uh, are uh, matters that God, in due time, and it will take centuries of delay, will answer. All three of those requests are uh, taken up then in verses, particularly verse 24, and, uh, and then again in verses 25 through 27. Or John, the apostle, in the last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 22:20, 20, even so, he says, come, Lord Jesus. And uh, that answer has been delayed now for centuries. Uh, there are these delays in the answer to certain prayers that do cover centuries. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? And we need to learn as Christians to receive no answers, yes answers, wait a while answers, and realize that uh, in response to our faith, God does know what's best, and uh, that he is faithful to weave things together to bring about the resolution of those things that our hearts cry for. Uh, many, many examples in Scripture of uh, delayed answers. Then on number 10, on the next page, Petition, like any aspect of prayer, needs to be with holy hands. And, and uh, this paragraph marks out several different biblical um, things that are necessary for us to expect, and rightly expect, answers to prayer. And we mentioned things like holy, you could underline that, holy hands in 1 Timothy 2.8, uh, to pray in righteousness, 2 Timothy 2.22, uh, to pray with pure hearts, 1 Peter 3.12, and then uh, 
to ask God in faith, Matthew 21, 22, whatever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive, to uh, request in Jesus' name, in the famous upper room discourse of John uh, 13 through 16, actually through 17. And then another way to put it is to pray according to God's will. Uh, the next line, uh, with motives that honor the Lord, our motives need to be right. Uh, they need to be God-pleasing rather than selfish. And then the final line, responding to God's word obediently. Obedience is very important. And we also could add others like praying in the Spirit. That phrase uh, mentioned twice in the New Testament. For example, Ephesians 6.18 and Jude verse 22, praying in the Spirit. Uh, closely joined with those two passages on praying in the Spirit is the great, most famous passage in Romans 8, 26 and 27 where uh, we need to pray with the help of the Holy Spirit because we do not know what we should pray as we ought. And so the Holy Spirit does assist us in prayer as we pray in the Spirit. That is, with a dependence upon the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit and uh, such emphases. The opposite to that, uh, to uh, what uh, chapter or number, number 10 here is emphasizing, would be to pray as in Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And in that passage, as you study the context, the psalmist himself is not praying that way. He's not regarding iniquity. And so he's not among those the Lord does not hear. He strongly emphasizes, if I regard iniquity in, in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But then he makes it clear in his next statement that the Lord does hear him. Because his heart is apparently in accord as in these emphases upon holiness and righteousness, purity, imperfect, and the sinner that he is. All right, so then uh, number 10, where it emphasizes praying in Jesus' name, that, that kind of wording is developed in number 14. Our prayer should be in Jesus' name, that is, uh, in ways that he himself put his, put, could put his own signature to as approving, in his honor, in his power, for his glory, in such uh, ways of wording it. The next uh, point on page 25 is that we need to uh, pray intercessory prayers. We, we do need to grow and branch out in our uh, prayer lives so that we don't allow, as often is the case of young believers, uh, allow our prayers to be pretty much concentrated upon ourselves. And while we certainly know from Scripture that it's okay to pray for yourself, and there are these many examples, that we rather should develop a symmetry, not a cemetery, but a balance, a coordination, and a harmony of different aspects of prayer so that we become more well-rounded in prayer and more fully developed in prayer, as the Bible makes clear. And that comes with maturity, uh, with the growth, and with paying attention to what are the different aspects and then uh, letting God lead us in working on these and, and, and uh, inculcating them, incorporating them into our actual daily practice. So we have point E, intercessory prayer. What is prayer? It's, it's um, having intercessory vigils for other people. And the many examples uh, for several pages that uh, show you cases where uh, people have uh, prayed for others. As the first example, number one, Abraham prayed for the deliverance of believers in those cities uh, when God was ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we want to say more about that later. There is a section uh, later where we will take up some of the great prayer warriors in Scripture and later even some of those outside of Scripture. Uh, but just to note it very briefly here. It may be that there are questions. If there are, uh, feel free to, uh, to, to ask these as we move along because we have many different pages that give examples 
galore on uh, cases where there are intercessory prayers. If no questions, I uh, would um, kind of take it for granted here that having read this, you would be aware of the tremendous um, plethora of examples, even on intercessory prayer. I'd never uh, thought of, uh, of um, such a breadth of intercessory prayer as I came to think of once I had gone through Scripture and leaned out these examples. It uh, deeply impressed me, uh, and I had never before realized that there were so many examples uh, that could be drawn out of the, the Word of God. On page 35, affirmations. What is prayer? It, it includes often, in, for example, in the Psalms, just those times when we recount, uh, when we recite, when we declare or affirm different truths about God, about this world, about sinners, about ourselves, about our friends. For example, Lord, you know Charlie's problem. As you're praying for Charlie and the church. And of course, that's just a recitation, a recounting, uh, and it's a recognition too that God knows. And so there are many examples of uh, declarations of affirmations. On uh, number, um, number two, in Psalm 3, verse 2, But you, Lord, are a shield, a shield of protection here to me. And uh, we have one of our for sale sets of notes over on the counter there on different names or descriptions of our Lord which we can use in our prayers, and it will help us to develop a versatility and a balance in uh, praying to him in light of all that he is, rather than uh, narrowing it down and uh, becoming too tight in our, uh, in our praying. We could think of him not only as a shield, but as the great shepherd, or as the bread of life, or as the light of life. All of these illustrations, analogies, where there are human, this world, illustrations of things that God is somehow like. Or living water. He is our living water. He is our rock. And so often it comes out in the Psalms. Our fortress, our high tower. And on and on go the descriptions. And as we learn to use some of these that are ready at hand, that are so suggested by Scripture, our own prayers, I believe, as long as there is vitality and fervency in them, as long as there is real sincerity, purity in them, uh, can uh, broaden and uh, become far more uh, varied, more versatile. Number uh, eight, my voice you will hear in the morning. And some say, well, I'm not a morning flower. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a night person. And that's true that some are. But on the other hand, we have quite an emphasis many times in Scripture upon uh, prayer in the morning, as here. And it may be that uh, we have sold things short, have not really thought about the possibilities too much, and we're willing to settle for too less, too, too, too little. It may be that um, even we ourselves, as uh, night people, uh, could also get some great uh, benefit out of learning to get up in the morning and pray. And uh, someone has said, I'd rather live on it than sleep on it. Although we know that we can do both, it's just a great idea to um, follow the example of many in the scripture and start the day off with prayer. There's a famous poem, Author Unknown, that says, it's called, I Met God in the Morning. It goes this way. I met God in the morning when the day was at its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long his presence lingered, all day long. He sailed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered, other ships were sore distressed, but the winds that seemed to drive them brought to me a perfect rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mine, when I too had loosed the moorings with his presence left behind. So I think I know the secret, learned from many a troubled way. 
You must meet him in the morning if you want him through the day. Pretty good poem. I would change the wording right there at the end so that we recognize that he's always with us, even when we utterly fail. And I would change the wording this way. You must meet him in the morning if you'd sense him through the day. We lose a sense of God sometimes, even though he's very much there. From his side, faithful. From our side, there's unfaithfulness. But praying in the morning. My voice you will hear in the morning. And then to continue in a spirit of prayer and a tone of prayer throughout the day. Any uh, questions on this section on affirmations, declarations, recitations, recountings, counting your blessings, or whatever we call it? Yes, Gregory? Can I ask a question on the intercession? The question on intercession is fine, yes. Ask the question. For example, I pray for my dad's salvation every day. Is that something that I can um, continue on doing until the day he dies? Um, or is that something that would show a lack of faith? I don't know. That is a really excellent question. Let me repeat it. And it is the question... Uh, when we think of intercessory prayer, is it okay to continue to pray, for example, for a father's salvation and pray that for many years, or is that a sort of a demonstration of our lack of faith? Why not just pray once and then believe God and leave it there? Uh, my own opinion on that would be that uh, with an illustration such as George Mueller of Bristol, England, who uh, prayed for about 63 years uh, for some, some for their salvation, I think of um, Dolores Michelson in our church here. Uh, she and her uh, husband Burton, staunch uh, prayer warriors uh, in, the, in the church that John MacArthur pastors. And just this past Christmas time, uh, she came out with an email of two pages in which she described her prayers for her mother until she was 92 and how her mother would always put her off and never could seem to see the light or the need to receive Christ. And so the burden continued on uh, Dolores' heart. She continued to pray for her mother and then uh, in her 92nd year she went to visit her mother, her mother's 92nd year, and she began to witness to her again and her mother said, yes uh, my dear, she said, uh, I have uh, a wonderful peace that I'll be in heaven. Well, Dolores immediately was uh, rather appalled by that, but because she thought that her mother didn't really understand the way and she'd miss heaven, that she was depending on some false hope. And so she began to witness to her anew, but Mom, do you understand? Yes, she says, I've been giving that a lot of thought, and I've prayed to the Lord, and I do believe he's the Son of God, and that he died for my sins, and I have received him. And uh, the upshot of the story is that Dolores became convinced that her mother had been saved. And this was the result of decades and decades of prayer for her salvation. I remember uh, what Amy Carmichael, missionary to India, said. She, she was the author of many books. And she said uh, that she prayed for Jambalai, Jambulai, who was the Robin Hood of India. And humanly speaking, it appeared impossible that Jambulai could ever receive Christ. He was very wicked. But Jambulai did come to know Christ in answer to prayers. Yes, there are many examples like that. I remember in my own case praying for many years for my father's salvation, hardened rancher in Arizona, who always had the right answer to my witnessing who would say, Jim, when you get as old as I am, and you've been around to as many religious groups as I've been into, you pick up a little here and a little there, and you put it all together, you get the real religion, Jim. And besides, Jim, I'm good to my neighbors. Everybody knows I'm a good guy. And he was depending upon his own merits. And besides, he would say, Jim, if you understood, Christ didn't need to die on that cross to be a victim like that. And I would respond, but Dad, he was there on purpose. That was part of the plan. He died in our place 
He had to do that. That was part of what the scripture had predicted that was explained many ways in the New Testament. No, Jim. You keep studying and you'll see the truth. So he would not receive the Lord. Different prayer groups at Dallas Seminary, where I attended, would uh, pray for family members such as my dad. We continued to pray through the years. And in the final year of his life, at the age of 65, he came to know Christ. It was a sort of miracle in his life. Yeah, the case was that Pastor McGuffey, a local pastor who had befriended Dad, and he would go down to my dad's retirement, he sold the ranch, retirement place, pool hall, youth center in the city, and would just sit there and chew the fat with, discuss things with these elderly men who were playing games like pool, and would uh, crack jokes with them and uh, let them know that he was a real person. He was interested in them. And so on one occasion, Dad said to Mom, let's invite the McGuffeys over. They've been so nice to us. But uh, I've checked and I've found out that Billy Graham is preaching on TV that night and that'll take up much, much of the evening. He won't have a chance to witness to us. And so they came, they had supper, and then they were in the living room. Remember many years of prayer for him. Billy Graham finally finished his message in that great stadium. And you know, his customary way, he said, now I want all of those who want to receive Christ to come forward and stand before me on this platform. And I want to have a word with you, give you some literature. Although he'd say, literature. Mom went out of the room into the kitchen. She came back into the doorway and dad was on his knees in front of the TV set, one of those who were responding to that message. It was unbelievable. He looked up at Mom. Mom said, Dad, what's the matter? She thought he had fallen. He said, Mom, I'm a different man. Pastor McGuffey got up and laid his hand on his shoulder and said, Brother Roscoe, I believe you've been saved. Yes, I do believe from many experiences that uh, we can continue to pray for people and that it is not, if our motives are right, it is a demonstration of faith. Again, go back to Amy Carmichael. She said, if when I prayed for someone who needs salvation, I give up the burden. I don't know anything really about the depths of Calvary love. I believe she had a point. I can know something of the depths of Calvary love, but not the full depths that would hang in there that would persist. That's part of the persevering aspect of prayer, to continue praying. Uh, one of our best illustrations is, is uh, George Mueller in Bristol, England, who, as I said, would pray 63 years for some, some of whom were saved after he died. It became clear that they had received the Lord. I believe it's a matter of motives, that if our motives are right, as God reads the hearts, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, he does, or 1 Samuel 2, verse 3, by him actions are weighed. That if he sees that the motive is, is pure, is right, then that's what makes it worthwhile. If, it, if it's a motive of faith, of purity, a hang in there attitude that will not let this matter go, but regards it to be so very important that one will continue to ask God. And it, prayer is not over, overcoming God's reluctance the old saying, but laying hold of his willingness. But why does God delay? Well, possibly several reasons to develop patience in us, to let us have opportunity to demonstrate the reality of our faith and to grow to a greater depth of faith by continuing to ask. He wants us to display our love for him by continuing to ask, as Amy Carmichael has suggested. There are good byproducts that God does weave into our lives, uh, as um, like Abraham. Like Daniel, uh, if Daniel were alive today in this world, he would still be waiting for the answer to his prayers of Daniel 9, at least of certain aspects there. So I would have to answer that uh, with, with, with uh, very uh, sure conviction, that not cocksure conviction, but sure conviction based on scripture and example that yes, um, although I don't understand it fully, why God would uh, delay, 
that I can continue to ask in good faith and expect God to come through. But in the meanwhile, my patience can grow, my faith can develop, my love can deepen. And not only that, but then the example to other people, like, for example, when Dolores Michelson's mother came to know Christ at 92. What an example that is when it goes out in email that touches the hearts of many people and says, you too, don't give up. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend can be saved. So I would answer it that way, hope, hoping that that is right. I believe it is. Thanks for asking. Any other questions on these sections we've looked at so far? Feel free. Then we have, uh, as we go past uh, affirmations, we come to a section, what is prayer? It's questions. We often have questions in Scripture. Uh, moving from Genesis 4, verse 7, Cain asked the Lord, and since he was actually conversing with the Lord, I, I call that, in essence, prayer. Am I my brother's keeper? He asked God. And then we have questions uh, running through Scripture. Uh, down on uh, page 37, uh, Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit, your presence? And then the psalmist, having asked that question, answers it with affirmations that God already is present wherever we might go. And so we have that mixture, that mingling, that coordination, that balance of different aspects. Here we have question and then affirmations. It reflects to us that our prayers also can include a number of different aspects as well as be inwoven with a number of different attitudes. Prayer is much, much more than we may have ever dreamed when we grow in it and put more of it together. And none of us will ever grow to the point where we need no further growing. It will only be when the rapture occurs, when we're totally complete in the Lord, that uh, we will not uh, need to pray as we do here on earth. I, although I do believe that there will be conversation in heaven, and in essence a kind of, uh, kind of prayer, as we uh, will we'll ever be praising God, and that's an aspect of prayer. We will not need to confess sin. We will never have any sense of lack that, that causes us to or prompts us to give petitions or intercessions because all will have been resolved. But certainly, praise Thanksgiving. Uh, eternally, even. And then point H, there are attitudes on uh, page 38, attitudes related to prayer. We've looked at a whole bunch of different answers to the question of what is prayer. We've We've seen that it's a number of different things. We could liken these to slices in an orange. Uh, all the different slices it takes to make up the composite unified orange. But th there also are attitudes that ought to be invested in, in prayer, and we've looked at some of these here. We've developed these far more in the second, the smaller syllabus. On uh, page 39, we have several of them listed, like listening, watching, and so on. If you have not looked ahead in your small syllabus, you will find that chapter 5 there will be especially on the subject of listening, and will therefore develop this much, much more than this paragraph here. You will also find that chapter 11 in the small syllabus will go into great detail, several pages on watching, and it even has a section on making a distinction between listening and watching. At first, people think that maybe they're about the same thing, and uh, there are ways in which they do appear to be the same thing, listening, watching. Both of them, for example, are urging alertness, attentiveness uh, upon us, aggressiveness in uh, prayer. Uh, in, in that, they are rather alike. But then we've mentioned a great number of uh, differences, distinctions between them in that chapter 11, uh, later on in that chapter. So I would urge you to look at that uh, sometime in the near future, even before you're assigned to do it, just like a uh, prairie scout who would ride ahead of the wagon train and find out the lay of the land even before they get there, uh, which is a good idea. Uh, listening is basically, basically hearing. 
as often in the scripture, hear ye the word of the Lord. Or Jesus in Matthew 13 in the parable of eight, the uh, chapter of eight parables like the uh, sower in the soil, the, the wheat and the tares and so on, emphasizes take heed how you hear. Or Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches of Asia. And each one of them emphasizing here what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, hearing it, hearing God's word, listening to it. Hearing God's word, also hearing, that is, listening to people, what's going on in the world, so that we may, might know what is going on, and aware people, and conscious of uh, what's in our world. Watching has more of a thought of, um, notice uh, the end of that first line, the beginning of the second line, exercising discernment and being in an on-guard posture, or a guardedness, watchfulness in that sense. To be uh, watchful about things that we can pray about, so that we pray up-to-date, relevant prayers, and also watching in a defensive kind of a posture against the wiles of the wicked one, who with his temptations can allure us, and in many slick ways uh, lead us astray. Also watching for the sake of other believers what's going on in their lives so that we might better know how most strategically to pray for them and hit the nail on the head so to speak uh, to pray really relevant prayers. Watching in terms of looking at prayer letters so that we can detect what uh, these missionaries are really facing what their warfare struggles involve, so that we can pray not general prayers, but prayers that are right on the mark, that would help us to um, battle Satan backwards, and um, usher the gospel into hearts through prayer. So I believe there is a difference, and again I leave you to chapter 11, which will develop in quite a bit of detail. I sat down one summer and studied the scripture just on that issue and um, said, is there a difference or isn't there? And uh, finally had to decide there is a distinction, although there are certain ways in which they, ways they have in common. And then waiting is more the idea of trusting, hoping, expecting with confidence. Uh, this um, balanced with patience. And so it's very difficult for me to make a distinction between what waiting means and what faith means, or what trust means. It's a kind of a trustful patience, or expectation, or confidence, reliance upon God. As we look at the different word, words that are used for it in, in Scripture, for example, in the Psalms, and what they mean. Meditating, uh, point D, it can be, notice, an act of meditation. Like, for example, I meditated this morning on Psalms 144 and 145. Saw some glorious things there, like in Psalm 145, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. My, my heart echoed that. I said, yeah, that's true. It's, you are great, Lord. Affirmation. You are worthy of great praise. And so meditation is just really reflection. Notice line 5, beginning of that line, reflection. The next line, juicing things in a contemplative way. Just juice the scripture. Draw from it the nectar, the savor of it. As we dwell upon it, notice the next line, dwelling on the word. Or even the next line, thinking on the things of God in a, in a reflecting sort of way. And I believe that when that happens, when we meditate upon different passages of the Word, this can lead then into point E, uh, into a life that's truly become Scripture-saturated. How do we become Scripture-saturated? By many times of meditation uh, in a lifetime and during a pastorate, whatever, that uh, we start at some point and through the days, the weeks, the months, the years, we build a a consistent habit, pattern of um, 
dwelling upon Scripture, meditating upon it, and many times of meditation, and then we become Scripture-saturated. And then we bring that Scripture saturation back to the Scripture when we meditate on it anew. It's like we've taught in hermeneutics that the more we come to know about the Word of God in its different contexts, the more we have a treasury, a resource, that we then can bring back to the Scripture. And when we're studying a given passage, we, the Spirit can remind us, oh, this, this fits with such and such in another passage, or this word which we've already done a word study on in some other connection, is used here as well. Therefore, we already have some insight built in that we bring to that new study. And we keep building. We keep building a scripture saturation based upon many meditations. Also based upon memorization, hard study, light study, or whatever. So there is a sense in which uh, meditation does lead into scripture saturation, if it's the right kind of meditation. You and I know that there are some people who, being enemies of the faith, have avowedly, have devotedly uh, read scripture only to see what faults they could pick out of it. And so their meditation was industrious, but it was not uh, along those savory lines that uh, the Lord would recommend. But uh, those who love the Lord, who, who are really devoted in love to Him, will be the ones who will meditate, uh, really hanging on every word and longing after it, longing after the Lord. We need to make sure that uh, in our times of meditation, we don't get lost in the meditation and lost from the Lord in a sense. We, we need to make sure that we conduct our meditation in such fashion that we uh, try um, with uh, real spiritual discipline to keep the Lord always in focus and how this passage uh, leads us to him. What it says about him, because he's the one we're interested in primarily. And not just studying facts, not just writing down details. We do that, of course, as part of the uh, meditation, part of the study. However, we want to keep him at the very center, in the very heart of it, so that we're actually having fellowship with him in the very times that we do meditate. And then when we're not looking at Scripture, as we've built up that uh, reservoir within our hearts, although not looking at Scripture and driving down the freeway, we can be meditating upon that Scripture we did look at, but now it's in our hearts. Like in Psalm 119, 9 through 11, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word, thy word have I hid in my heart. And then he says that I might not sin against thee. It's that... Um, it's that um, act or that process of many acts which then becomes an attitude, a habit form, that we persist in. So that whether we're in the scripture with the scripture open before us or whether we're in a situation riding a horse or driving a car where we cannot be looking at the pages of scripture, yet the pages of scripture are inbuilt like in, uh, what is it, Second Corinthians chapter 3, you are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men, there can be that in writing upon the hearts of the Word of God. In that case, it's Christians who are written upon the hearts of people like Paul. But there is a sense in which Scripture itself can be written upon the heart as well. Questions on what we've just looked at. Again, chapters 5 and 11 in the smaller syllabus will go into great detail about uh, the distinctions there. Yes. Scripture saturation. Uh, the smaller syllabus more helps. Um, seems to refer to scripture saturation as an aspect of prayer, while it's listed here as an attitude. How do you think is the best way to, to view that or to treat that? The question was uh, should we view the uh, matter of scripture saturation as an attitude or an aspect, and that the smaller of our two uh, syllabi. At one point, it seems to suggest that it might be an aspect as well as an attitude. And I would say, yes, uh, there is a sense in which um, sometimes scripture saturation becomes an aspect that uh, is like the aspect of petition. It's with uh, this aspect in view that we then come and uh, it uh, feeds into our petition, feeds into our confession, and contributes along with them as kind of an equal element. 
Uh, I would be willing to see it that way. However, I do believe that for the most part, scripture saturation like meditation is a basic attitude that as it's a tone, it's a spirit that's built within our lives. Um, it's like a subterranean stream that's there in our hearts that's been put there by, by meditation, by study, so that it is that tone, it's that spirit, uh, that level of thinking where, it's, uh, where the mind is on Christ and on a th spiritual things. So I choose rather to view it mostly as uh, really somewhat distinct in many cases from, from aspects such as um, praise, thanksgiving, uh, confession, petition, intercession, affirmation, questions, oaths, and such aspects, uh, which are normally recognized among believers. And see it as one of those attitudes, that is, as we feed our hearts to the extent that we become really scripture saturated, then that scripture saturation becomes a level, a subterranean stream, an attitude, a tone that we then um, use to juice all the aspects of prayer. It should then uh, flow into and permeate our confession, our confession itself then being uh, led by, directed by, prompted by scripture, so that that confession will be conducted along properly Christ-honoring lines. Our uh, tone or spirit or level of thinking, attitude that is, of scripture saturation should impact our petition by giving us uh, examples in scripture that encourage us to be people who also pray and believe that God will answer. Uh, also supplying us with verses about uh, asking for things and knowing what kinds of things we can ask that are pleasing to God, given biblical examples. Same way with intercession. So that I tend to view um, scripture saturation as well as, uh, as meditation as uh, attitudes which then should really flavor, tone, um, impregnate all the distinctive aspects of prayer. Every kind of aspect in which I could pray to God should be filled with, honeycombed with, um, toned by uh, the very impact that Scripture has made upon my life. So that my uh, petition, my intercession, my confession, my, my questions, even questions becoming respectful questions and not impudent questions challenging God in unbelief, as sometimes we see in Scripture. But rather questions that honor the Lord, that while they ask with great uh, desire to know, are questions that have the attitude within them that He has the answer, and I can look to Him for the answer. And I respect Him, so on. I honor Him, I glorify Him. And so an attitude that really should impregnate, should fill, should flavor, should tone, uh, every other aspect of prayer. Sometimes you don't know how to make an absolute distinction between these things, but you rather feel that the scripture leads you to think that there is an overall and very real distinction between them. Finally, I would see it that way. I hope I've answered your question. So for our purpose of our prayer time this week, uh, since scripture praying was the chapter that we're to read for this week, you want us to, would you like us to see that as an attitude then? See it as an attitude. Okay. The question was, should we, in our papers written for this class, see um, scripture saturation as an aspect or an attitude, and I would prefer uh, the attitude aspect there, as well as the same thing on meditation. Now we look on page uh, 40 at other attitudes uh, drawn from uh, Dwight L. Moody, the uh, founder of and the president of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, greatly used of the Lord in leading people to Christ and in preaching in many countries as well as in his pulpit there in Chicago. And he mentions five other essentials of prayer besides the attitudes we've just mentioned. Restitution, a heart that's willing to obey God and make good a wrong done, when with God's help we can do that and get it done. Make it right. Uh, that would be a part of righteousness of heart or purity or good motives expressed in that kind of a channel. And so if we know that we're on the outs with some person, 
uh, there is the need to deal with that person and try to get that thing finalized, resolved, so that there is um, clarity between the hearts. There is a resolution there, hopefully. There is a good spirit there. Uh, so that uh, it's true that that old saying comes into uh, play here, nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. He's my Lord and nothing between. Uh, so we, we do sin, and there are many times when we do need to make restitution in this way or that, and it's the attitude that we would um, get it done. We would eat crow uh, where that's necessary. We would swallow hard uh, where that is called for. Uh, we would show humility. Uh, we would display love. And we would seek to get the matter resolved so that there's no sin that's hindering, blocking the uh, flow of uh, uh, God's life through us. And we're not stumbling blocks to other people, hopefully. I've lived long enough to realize, men, that no matter what you do or how consistently you attempt to live, that you're going to have some enemies anyway. Uh, among non-believers who think that the Christian faith is obnoxious, or even sometimes among believers, like pastors in, in their relationship with others in the church, who have sought, though not perfectly, have sought hard to be pleasing unto the Lord and to the people, and yet certain people don't like the way they speak, don't like the illustrations they use, don't like their facial appearance, or this or that. Don't like the fact that they don't show up at certain meetings. Sometimes a pastor has many meetings to attend and might, uh, for the very sake of priority of getting the job done, not be there at a certain meeting like a baseball club game. And he just can't be there. Just as, for example, John MacArthur can't be at all meetings like our chapel this morning. He's on vacation right now. So he went through the, uh, the different steps to get that clarified with Dr. Businitz and possibly we'll come back at a later time. There are many reasons why people resent us. But there is also the reason that we need to look to the Lord and as far as it lies within us, as Romans 12 tells us, to get things resolved. We need, as far as lies within ourselves, to be at peace with all men. Even then, you know, some will have a bone to pick with us. That's an old expression. Uh, they will have something against us. And then we have to just leave it with the Lord in a prayer that he will work within not only our own heart to show us if there are any ways we need to change, but also work within a, other people's hearts so that he can reveal to them if there are ways that they need to change so that we blend together in sweet fellowship. Sometimes that happens. Praise God when it does. Uh, be a forgiving spirit of mercy. Lord Herbert long ago said this, that um, the person who will not forgive others destroys the bridge over which he himself must cross. We are constantly in need of forgiveness. If we will not forgive other people, we, so to speak, destroy the bridge over which we ourselves must cross. We need that bridge to have fellowship with God. We need to get things resolved and have a spirit of mercy toward other people. Be very forgiving people. And then unity, the unity of different believers, or unity with God and with other, others, as in John 17, where jo Jesus prayed for that. And also a unity that's sometimes expressed when two or three gather in prayer, as in Matthew 18, 19. Uh, that is primarily in a discipline, church discipline context. It is my conviction that while it's in a church discipline context that that principle is a given, that um, the principle that is given in a, in a church discipline context is a principle that we also need to practice even in cases that are not church discipline cases. We, there is this, this principle that sometimes two or three can get together in prayer and agree upon that and God will work things. For example, like in the early days when Dawson Trotman 
who became a great navigator leader later, but in the LA area where he would go up in the mountains with uh, a friend or two of his and they would take a map and think of different places and pray for these that, that the light of the gospel would come in. And they would, they would agree about this. And thus they would deliberately, earnestly pray about God bringing that light. Indeed, uh, later as he matured and as doors were opened, he himself, along with others like Lauren Sani and Bob Foster, even many other navigator people, did bring the gospel to many countries and saw much, much fruit. So much so that when Dawson Trotman gave his life at Scroon Lake in New York, by jumping in the water to save the life of a girl who had fallen into those icy waters, he did lift her up and help her to get back into the boat. But then he himself somehow, for some reason, sank back into those waters unto his death. And the world the mid-50s was shocked by the death of one of their giants. And at his funeral, Billy Graham said, Dawson Trotman has touched more lives than any individual I ever knew. Uh, so was the impact of Dawson's life. Doss, they called him. And he would uh, pray in unity with other believers, even in non-disciplined cases. I do believe that as the uh, principle is used in Matthew 18, it is definitely in a context of church discipline. And it is brought into service in that regard. But that the principle of that matter is one that ought to be true many times when we don't just pray ourselves, but on certain occasions get together with another person or even further persons. And even sometimes many people, like in Acts 12, where the church was gathered to pray for the release of Peter, who uh, was to be put to death the next day. And so with others we pray that uh, God might do something great. We can pray alone. We can pray with another person. We can pray like wife or son or daughter, friend. We can pray with an unbeliever as we're introducing the gospel and seeking to lead that person to Christ as we would prompt him to pray his own prayer to God in which we join. That, that is, it's unto salvation for him. We can also pray in groups as in the church, a football team, whatever. And then point D, faith, basically the idea of waiting, waiting upon God, trusting him for a resolution to things even though it involves patience. Sometimes patience for a very brief time, and then the answer, or other times like with Abraham, Daniel, uh, a great, great long delay in the answer. Let's we'll stop right here for our break. We'll take our break, and then we'll come back and pick it up uh, with point E. We're looking at some of these attitudes that uh, are involved in uh, prayer, and we're on page 41, point E, submission to do God's will. The old saying, the greatest mission is submission. Christ, the great example of that, as in Philippians 2, where he became obedient even to the death of the cross. Other great examples in Scripture like Joseph, Daniel, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Paul, Peter. Peter, after his experience when he forsook the Lord. Uh, Peter, that is, in the book of Acts. I mentioned here that we can even pray when we detect our slothfulness and coldness toward God. As you often have that um, phrase in Psalm 119, Quicken me, O God or uh, shoot new life into me. Give me a real boost. Lift me. Enliven me. And notice it, um, it occurs in uh, several different verses of Psalm 119. So when we are not what we ought to be, we can even petition God for help that we might be that, and do that along with our confession. And so that we would uh, be on praying ground with the Lord. And we can pray, Lord, make me willing. Help me to be willing. 
I really want to be as far as I know my heart, but I know I'm such a sinner and so weak and fail you in so many ways. However, Lord, I really want to be right with you and uh, show me how I can do that. Point me to Scripture, speak to me out of Scripture, and get underneath my life and lift me up and uh, put me where I ought to be. And when you show me something, help me indeed to respond with obedience and with submission. And so we look to the Lord then to be our strength, to be our everything. And then uh, point F, a deep caring love. Notice it says love. We also could mention as an attitude joy or even peace, love, joy, peace. We can mention other of the uh, fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and humility. But the one I'm looking on at the moment is a deep, caring love. Uh, John 14, 21 through 23 underlines the importance of that love, and when it really is vitally there, uh, Christ says that He will come, He and the Father, and make themselves known or real to us, and we will know their presence. The deep, caring love. That attitude. It's like uh, the, the famous missionary writer Carl Lawrence. He's quite famous, although you may never have heard that name. There are many great servants of God you and I have never heard the names of. But Carl Lawrence, who used to live near me there in... Uh, La Mirada, California, went to the uh, Quaker Church, the Friends Church, Granada Heights Friends Church near the uh, Biola campus, near the Talbot Seminary campus where I taught for many years. And we have a lunch group of men that has met since 1976 on Fridays at Burger King or Carl's Jr. in a back room and anywhere from 8 to 16 of us meet. And uh, some of the people have changed through the years. Carl has come a number of times. He's traveled to many places in the world and written fine books that have helped many people. And he says that on one occasion he was at a great conference and uh, he was out for lunch with uh, the famous Dr. Frank Laubach, who wrote one of the great books on prayer. And Dr. Laubach said, I know where we can go. I know this place, and so they went down these steps, went down into the basement, and there was a restaurant down there, and as they sat at the table, the, uh, the waiter was very surly, very moody, very mean, and he was grumbling, and Carl Lawrence said that he just felt this reaction within himself of being disgusted with that man, and so he, he said that to Dr. Laubach. And Dr. Laubach said, and Carl said he would never forget this, he said, that man is in great need. Uh, what we really need to do is pray for him. And so right there they, they had a word of prayer for that man. Uh, it's part of watchfulness that one would be on to someone's need and have a deep caring love that would uh, be interlaced with that watchfulness so that he would actually move into action uh, to, in that case, to pray for that uh, person. And we need to be watchful. We also need in our watchfulness to have this deep, caring love that's listening, to hear things, that's watchful, on guard, uh, to be perceptive, to be aware uh, when needs are mentioned or when we can see needs in people's lives so that we then can pray intelligently, relevantly, uh, very caringly for people. On some occasions we will even have the opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with that person and to have a chance to minister out of that uh, deep caring love. It's just a good attitude to have. In fact, it's a very uh, necessary attitude to have if we're going to be pleasing to the Lord. Because time and ministry will afford us many such occasions for us to display whether we're really ministers at heart or whether we're pretty much self-ingrown and only working our way through ministry in a mechanical fashion. That brings us on uh, 
unless there are questions, to section three, the time of prayer. Section three, we're moving a little bit ahead here now. Uh, Lewis, question. The question is, what is the purpose of uh, point E, uh, submission to do God's will, uh, when uh, there is a sense in which God sovereignly will uh, certainly do His will anyway? Well, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that except to come at it this way, that um, it's like anything else in, uh, in the Christian life when we um, realize that we are co-laborers with God, as 1 Corinthians 3 does tell us, then we want to have that heart that is after His heart, and uh, so we sense from his uh, word, from scripture saturation, uh, what his will is as taught by scripture. And therefore we want to uh, pray for the very things that we know to be pleasing in his sight to, to be done. Like for the salvation of people. Like for the uh, growth of believers. And while in a sense God will be faithful to tutor those believers or faithful to draw to himself those who are his elect, and do that unerringly. He, he cannot fail. If he did fail, then his elective purpose would be incomplete. And so from his side, he will pursue it without fail. But from our side, since we are co-laborers, and since we want to be after his heart, uh, we long for the same things. And so it becomes very uh, natural, very spontaneous, uh, that our heart cry should be for those things that we know will please our master. Uh, we, we, we want to pray things that we know He will be honored by. Uh, like it says in uh, Romans 8, 26, 27, kata theon, according to God. Or as some translate, according to, according to God's will. We don't want to, uh, if we have any real desire to follow Christ at all, we don't want to pray contrary to His will, as if we're kind of a God ourselves. But if we really are committed to the belief that he is utterly wise and righteous and good and that his uh, purpose is a loving one that uh, wants to bring blessing upon people, uh, then we want to get onto that and uh, ask him to bring that blessing upon them, which we know is his will. So it's just an expression of being co-laborers with God. It, it really does display that we really with him and step with him. And gladly so, because we have a servant spirit. Thy will be done, as Jesus said. And then we know that, uh, that uh, Scripture also teaches us that it may be that God then will, in the course of time, show us that a certain thing is not God's will. And then we should be ready to practice submission in that sense, that we would gladly uh, acknowledge that uh, as far as we can discern, it is not God's will after all, therefore we draw back from it, and uh, we've grown through this to learn new obedience along the right track rather than the wrong track and uh, learned how to be committed to something else that, uh, that is his will. I, I gave the illustration earlier in class about my own high school desire for certain girls that I went with that they should be my wife and uh, very a young believer then, had a lot to learn, still do, but uh, as, as the uh, course of time uh, and God's dealings showed me uh, these were not his will and Although puppy love uh, has a hard time getting over these things, uh, we die hard on those matters, yet later on we discover that uh, God was very good to us, that, we, uh, that He denied us uh, things that were not His will, so that we might then learn to be submissive to those sweet things that turn out to be His will. Like for, in my case, Mildred, who is my wife. How much better than choices I was so ready to commit myself to in my ignorance, in my immaturity, and so on. Uh, that uh, probably is not a complete answer, but that is probably one of the core issues. It's just a matter of uh, wanting to pray after God's heart and wanting to share with God uh, the great things that He's about. 
Because we love him. Because we love his people. Because we love his work, his church, so on. And uh, it becomes a spontaneous, a natural cry for the heart that is um, somewhat at least committed to go his way. And that's part of being led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Walk by the Spirit. And, and, and then that leads in that same passage, that same context, from verses 16 and 17 on into verses 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit. These are the uh, inwoven, uh, outreaching effects, results of um, walking by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit leads to fruit of the Spirit in line with, in submission to God's will. We have the same heartbeat God has then. And if we don't have that same heartbeat, uh, we need to learn to pray that God will graciously correct us through the process of discipline, like Hebrews 12, as he, you know, he disciplines every son that he receives. He chastises his sons with a very good intention to shape us up to um, be conformed to Christ, to his will, and so on. And it's not redundant, because um, uh, from one sense of his sovereignty, he will surely uh, pursue and accomplish all that is his will. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says that from ancient times, uh, he has been committed to carry out his will, uh, to do all my good pleasure, he says. And those are tremendous verses that show that God will accomplish all that he sovereignly intends to do. But then because we are really committed to his will, it's the wisest, the best thing for us to pray uh, with sensitivity and with submission uh, that his wise, his good will be done and not our foolish, off-key kind of will. I hope I've helped, but on my feet I can't think of all. I, oftentimes when you go back to your study, you can think of five or six different uh, approaches to it when you have more time to meditate on it. Uh, that is often the case because God's word is a many splendored thing and uh, uh, just has so many different arms and channels of truth. It's so rich. How could we ever, at one standing or even one sitting, capture all that is uh, a part of that many splendored thing? A good question, however. Eugene. Answer that question by saying that for well, the reason we're supposed to pray is because even though God's will is going to be done, um, is because number one, He commanded us to pray, and also because um, it's prayer is the means by which God has said that He's going to He's going to do things in our lives, so that prayer gets us into the place where God can work, so that we can depend on Him even more, build our faith. I've heard it explained that way, and I don't know. If that's, well, I believe you've heard well. The um, question uh, boils down to um, God working in our lives so that he can bring us around uh, to uh, the point of um, learning better how to do his will. But I think that that is really what I've just been trying to say the last five minutes, too. We're saying it in different ways. It comes down to the same essence, same bottom line, that, yes, God works sovereignly in our lives in so many different um, fashions to um, shape us up, to... Uh, conform us to uh, be in line with his uh, own way of thinking. Uh, we not only have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, all believers do once they have become part of God's family, but we also in a practical sense can express the mind of Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about there, that uh, by the Holy Spirit's presence in that passage, 1 Corinthians 2. By the Holy Spirit's presence, by His leading, he, uh, he builds people who are spiritual, who are mature, and leads them to um, actually to express that mind of Christ that we already have been given. Years ago, uh, I remember they um, built a new library at Dallas Seminary, and then they formed a student um, line from the third floor of one building down and across the lawn to the new building, handing uh, library books over from one person to another and then getting thousands of books transferred to the new library. And we could say that in that library, we have 
the fullness of knowledge of that library. But then in a practical sense, we students would go in there and check out books. We would read this and that. We would look in the library section as you guys do here at this seminary. And in a practical sense, we would tap into that vast reservoir of potentially what we had in that library. And it's very much that way with Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We haven't lived it all yet, but in a practical sense, we can act by act. We can step by step right, actually enact parts of aspects of what is his will. But no one of us will ever come to a fullness of that, as only God does. But uh, he, he is very patient with us. So as far as I've been able to hear your question, as you've so well uh, voiced it here, uh, I would say that we're really, I think we're saying the same thing. That uh, it boils down to uh, God bringing us around to the point where we can better understand and do his will. So he's very good, he's very wise, he's very thoughtful, considerate to do that. Any other questions? Yes, Greg? Under uh, point B, uh, forgive me, spirit and mercy, the uh, reference that you gave was Matthew 6, 12 through 15. Could you offer some explanation specifically on verse 15? The question asked us to uh, give some explanation of Matthew 6, verse uh, 15. Matthew 6.15 in uh, regard to page 40 and point 2b in the syllabus. Okay, let's look at Matthew. Six fifteen. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. I understand that as um, prefaced by the contextual point, our Father, that uh, in a very real sense, only true believers have the right to call him our Father. And so he, it's in a context where Jesus is teaching, as in the larger Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7, uh, the kind of lifestyle he wants those who are his true people to reflect. It's not a way of life that earns or merits or deserves salvation, but it is rather that those who are saved um, could find a way to check their status by seeing whether they are living uh, something that approximates this kind of life, which would be because by their fruits you shall know them in chapter 7. So only believers could really call him Father, and it's in that context. It would be um, harmonious with other passages that talk about a once-for-all kind of forgiveness, uh, like Ephesians 1.7, in whom we have redemption through, his, um, through him, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Though he will never renege on that, he will never withdraw that. We are forever forgiven. Or Hebrews 10, 10 through 14, that we've been forever perfected in Christ. It's already taken place. Some um, express it as a positional kind of thing. I've never found a perfect word for that. Maybe positional is about as close as you might come to that. That positionally we are perfect. Positionally we have a once for all forgiveness. But in terms of our family or practical uh, walk with Christ hour by hour, we as children need to uh, practice forgiveness. And if we will not um, open the door of forgiveness to others, then by our very uh, closed-minded attitude, we, in a sense, shut the door that would make it um, appropriate that God forgive us in that, in that practical matter of life at the moment. The reason is, is that we ourselves have practically shut the door so that uh, God... Uh, being a morally true God uh, does not forgive, but rather he would wait on us and work within us to you know, bring us to conviction so that we would then actually uh, confess our sins as in 1 John 1, 9, and then he's faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, so then he can get us uh, on the ground that we need to be on where we would uh, be willing to practice forgiveness toward other people. Uh, and then the, um, 
Their, their freedom would be there within our hearts to have fellowship with God. There, there would be a freedom on his part to be able to have fellowship with people who before were obstinate toward and opposed to his will, but now in conformity to his will. So I see it like a lot of people do as a practical matter, uh, not at the moment dealing with the eternal um, matter of perfection or forgiveness that's always um, keeping believers secure, safe forever. And you'll find that as you look at commentaries like MacArthur's or uh, John Broadus on Matthew or Craig Blomberg on Matthew, uh, quite a number of others that they will emphasize basically this kind of thing. That God is, uh, is as it were, waiting for us to um, uh, operate uh, the way his word has taught us uh, before he can consistently uh, grant us, have the freedom to grant us. He always has freedom, but we are the ones who shut off the freedom so that we, we would open our hearts. Uh, actually, in another sense, the Spirit would open our hearts. And sometimes God has to deal with us in a disciplinary fashion uh, to get us to open our hearts or to help us open our hearts and bring us around to the point where we're then truly available to Him, uh, truly dependent upon Him truly humbled before him, truly ready, receptive, uh, to uh, have the door open to receive his forgiveness. So when we express forgiveness to another person and we do that genuinely, that itself becomes an expression of, of our own um, openness toward God. That openness toward God has opened our hearts toward others. Again, it's that thought that Lord, Lord Herbert gave, gave that I mentioned a few minutes ago that the one uh, who would not forgive others um, burns the bridge over which he, destroys the bridge over which he himself must cross. If we're not willing to forgive another person, then there's a, there's a block between us and God, and, and God being moral as he is, being committed to righteousness, is not, uh, at that point, um, going to forgive us. But if, if the rapture should occur at that moment, uh, when we're in this obstinacy against God as true believers, I believe that on the way up, that uh, among other things that God will gloriously do for us when he transforms us is that he would give us a mind that uh, will be one that will confess, that will, you know, get things straight. Obstinacy will fall away and uh, a, an attitude of submission, oneness, agreement will take place in our hearts. That among other things that he does to transform us. Just as in this case, if the rapture is not occurring, he will work through various kinds of discipline, through convicting us through other believers, through preached messages, through things we read, uh, to bring us around to the point where we finally will you know, become receptive toward him. And then, our hearts being open, he then gladly forgives us. I would see it that way. And it has uh, right before it, verse 14, if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There, there's a freedom there. Again, the, we close the door ourselves. In a sovereign sense, God wants to open that door and works in various ways to get it open. From our human standpoint, we must, we must cooperate with God in a sense, just as we must believe to be saved. God doesn't do things automatically somehow, or he doesn't work uh, coercing our will. It's like Calvin said that God uh, sweetly persuades our will. He doesn't force our will. He doesn't coerce our will. Other questions or else we'll move ahead here, whatever, whatever we need to do. Just a few minutes left here today. Going on with section three, then the time of prayer. Uh, the time or the times, plural. Pra prayer is practicing the presence of God, isn't it? If the devil can't beat you in prayer, he can't beat you. Uh, probably a passage such as Ephesians 6, 18 to 20, that passage on prayer coming right after the warfare passage, teaches us that if we're to do proper warfare, having on God's whole armor, we can only do that properly if we do it, saturating it with prayer. So Paul puts the two right together, warfare, prayer, in one unit. Now, looking at the times of prayer, A, the time within our daily lives, uh, and we have different times mentioned in Scripture. It's good that God has given us these 
examples like morning prayer, Psalm 5, verse 3, Jesus in Mark 1, 35, start the day off right and experience what we might call blanket victory, getting out of bed, mind over mattress. Don't roll over, roll out. And so we get up and we meet with the Lord. There's a seriousness that can be involved in this as we seek God. And there's a good sense that can be involved in this, like if you want to get up early in the morning, it's uh, in many cases a good idea, a wise thought to go to bed and get some rest that way. So that when the early morning time is there to get up, you're more likely to be able to get up. In my own case, I usually go to bed about 8.30. When I was in seminary, I didn't. I was much younger then, and oftentimes could have all-nighters, or get by on one or two hours, and uh, they'll be weary, though being weary could still keep going, but I can't do that now. It would be very, very foolhardy for me to try that. So I deliberately, a number of years ago, decided to try to get to bed 8.30 or 9, and then get up around 4.00. So you work ahead, you think ahead on this matter, you use good sense. Uh, many times I go to bed and there's a phone ringing and you know you answer the phone, it might be an hour or whatever, but that's part of ministry. And then also many times you go to bed and get your rest. I do believe that where we do faithfully minister unto the Lord, to people, we find that God does tide us through the next day. And because He's faithful. So morning prayer, Secondly, morning, noon, and night. In fact, Psalm 55 actually starts as the Jewish day started with evening. It, it actually says it in a different way. Evening, morning, noon. And I didn't realize that when I wrote this thing. I looked at it later and realized I had it in a backward sense here. Thirdly, seven times a day. We, meant, we see that in Scripture. Psalm 119, verse 164. Seven times a day. We need, we need to have a fluid habit of doing this so that, as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us, we actually can pray without ceasing. Not praying absolutely all the time because preparing a message, talking with people, uh, building a grocery list, shopping, driving with its many uh, things that call our attention away uh, will uh, make it impossible for us to pray without ceasing absolutely. But it's an attitude, it's a tone, it's a spirit that we have that is always one that, given freedom from other I, I, I objects, other things, our minds can just rather automatically, in a spiritual sense, can go to God. Uh, practicing the presence of God. Fourthly, praying at night, Psalm 42, 8. Acts 3, verse 1. Acts 10, 30. We have uh, prayer at different times then, and then midnight, Psalm 119, verse 62. It's interesting that Psalm 119, verse 57 says, The Lord is my portion. And then in that, um, that's just five verses before, we get to verse 62, If indeed the Lord is my portion, then I can get out of bed to worship Him and be filled with His presence. And then as the uh, poem I read a few minutes ago goes, I met God in the morning when the day was at its best, and His presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. It's often the case that if we start the day off on the right uh, side, on the right uh, spirit, we then uh, have a better human likelihood of continuing with that spirit during the day. If we neglect prayer in the morning, thinking that we'll find a time during the day, oftentimes we don't get that time because the busyness of life just rushes in upon us. We cannot ever find a time to do it. And we do not have that same glad sense, that fresh sense of God's presence many times. I've been there enough to know that that's the case with me at least. But when I start with God in prayer and get that good start, then there's a tone that's been set and I can uh, more likely then go through the day in that kind of spirit. Uh, number six, through the night or all night in some cases, like Jacob wrestling with God. There's a time later when I want to deal with that more at length, at a point where, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we want to look at some of the great prayer warriors of the Bible. 
We're just looking at the time element here. Praying through the night or all night long. Whether individually or with a group. And then we have number seven, before dawn, again early in the morning. I wrote a, a number of Western novels that got published, and I was at the Western Writers of America meetings in Sheridan, Wyoming, back about 1987, I believe it was, and uh, met this fellow there that had written many books called the Mountain Man series. William Johnstone, one of the world's best-known Western writers. Uh, had a number of um, times together with him. I asked him on one occasion when we were just having a, I was having a Coke, he was having a beer. And I asked him, I said, uh, William, how do, you, how do you crank out so many novels, Western novels? Not nearly as important as biblical matters to me. But he said, uh, I said, what's your schedule that you can do this? He said, well, I get up at 3 in the morning, get a cup of coffee, and set it nearby, I get on my typewriter, and I work till 7. Then he said, I take a shower, and then I go, and I'm deputy sheriff. Louisiana town at that time. I said, well, uh, you do that, how often do you do that? He said, every day of the week. He's an unsaved man. He, I thought, you know, he gets up three to seven as an unsaved person and, and has this kind of a vigil. And turns out Western novels that might entertain people for a while, but there's nothing eternal about that at all. And a lot that's rather screwy, <laughs> unclean. You read some of his novels, The Butchers, he talks about. The butcherings, horrible things that happen. Uh, it's hard to stay with it. But I thought, there's a lesson there for me. But I have a better reason to get up in the morning. I have, I have a better reason to lay before people than to write Western novels. It's, a, it's amazing what unsaved people sometimes can teach us. Number eight, day and night. Just uh, pro probably another way of saying praying without ceasing. Day and night at various times. Whenever the sense of need is prompted. My own human need, needs of circumstances that I'm in. Like in Nehemiah, where the enemy was there as they, as they sought to build a wall. And so they prayed day and night. Number nine, three weeks of special prayer. Very much like um, when uh, John Hyde, who, who came to be called Praying Hyde of India, left McCormick Seminary in the States, went over there, and became a part of the Chilkiote Conventions every year for a while, about the turn of the, the last century. And how he and a couple of other men would get together before they were going to have one of these conventions. Pastors, Christian workers would attend, some unsaved people would come. And they would pray for several weeks. Sort of like in Billy Graham crusades. Pray for several weeks and then they would see some amazing things happen to pastors being rejuvenated. Christian workers changed. People get saved. Three weeks of special prayer. And then Hyde would also go in while speaker was holding forth in the auditorium and would uh, get beside his cot or his bedside and would pray uh, for that speaker. Or sometimes he would come into the auditorium, sit near the back, and look at certain people that he knew something about and pray for them while, while the word was being preached. Three weeks of special prayer uh, these men engaged in before the Chilkiote conventions. And then number 10, uh, 10 days of special prayer is specifically mentioned as in Daniel 10, 2, and 3. And then as you uh, know something about the book of Daniel, realize that tremendous, momentous things happened in what the angel revealed to Daniel in the rest of chapter 10, in chapter 11, and chapter 12. Momentous things about Israel's future. And that was in a, in a time of um, 10 days of availability before God in prayer. Tom Hare of Ireland, called the Praying Plumber of Lisbon, A.W. Tozer wrote a book about him, an entire book of about 60 pages, I think it was, called um, Tom Hare, the Praying Plumber of Lisbon. And here he was, a lay person, uh, plumbing was his trade, and he decided early in his Christian life to pray one full night a week. 
And then he, several years later, as he continued to grow in the Lord, he then devoted two nights a week and still kept up, kept up his plumbing trade in the day. And then somewhat later, after some years of further maturing, he devoted three full nights a week. That is not, this is not to say that you or I should do this or can do this. Personally, I cannot and carry on my busy seminary teaching. I found that's impossible. It seems to be impossible for me. However, I'm glad for examples like this because at least they lay upon us the challenge that we might do a whole lot more than we are doing. But it's just an example that someone would devote days to prayer. Now, number 11 uh, that I didn't put in the uh, syllabus, um, one to three days of fasting with prayer, as in Ezra 8, verse 12. 8 verse 15, 8 15 and verses 21, 23, one to three days of fasting with prayer. So we have a lot of different things mentioned in Scripture as to prayer in our daily lives. Then secondly, the time in light of our own needs, our own circumstances. Not thinking in terms of midnight or dawn or noonday or whatever, but just the needs that come up. Like when we feel a pressing need, or God impresses us uh, when He wants us to do something. Or when we're getting ready to, to deliver a message. Or we're getting ready to talk to someone about Christ. And so, in light of those needs, we pray. And we can also be praying without ceasing along with that. And then, uh, secondly, praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 The uh, Greek word adialeptos adialeptos, the adverb that's used in that uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 passage constantly, unceasingly it's used also in 1 Thessalonians 1.2 We make mention of you in our prayers unceasingly, Paul says So you can understand that if Paul himself practiced this He's so very free then to challenge others to do this. It's very much like Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 where he gives his great prayers. He's praying for the, for the Ephesians. Then in chapter 6 he challenges them to pray, 6, 18 to 20. It comes off a life. It comes out of a heart that knows the reality of it. And I urgently desire that you, that I, uh, really model these things so that we then have the kind of the spiritual right to stand up before other people and with with sincerity, with purity of heart, uh, to lay this challenge upon the hearts of other people. That's about as far as we can go today. We'll pick it up uh, hopefully next time on number three there. God bless you and have a great week.